For those of you who've been following my channel for a while, you'll know that I usually start my videos with some sort of gag, joke, or meme, but after watching Netflix's Catla, I was honestly left speechless. I never thought an ending could be simultaneously beautiful and ugly. The worst part about it is no one I know has seen the show or even heard about it for that matter. And don't get me wrong, this isn't a 10 out of 10 amazing show that you should go out and start watching immediately. In fact, I found it rather slow at points but the last episode is just so crazy and moving and scary, it made me feel so many conflicting emotions, I just had to talk about it. I don't say this liberally, but Catla could be the craziest ending I've covered on my channel, and I'm excited to discuss it with you, even if it's just for my own sanity. And if you like what I'm putting down, please consider liking and subscribing. When I first watched the trailer for Catla, I was hooked. It's basically one of those slow-burning foreign crime dramas like Broadchurch, but with a sci-fi twist. Dead people covered in ash from a local volcano start reappearing in the small Icelandic town of Vik. Who are these people? Why is it happening? And do these resurrected beings, who by the way have all the memories of their past selves making them essentially clones, have more nefarious motives? I'm gonna start with the final episode and I'll do my best to explain what's going on even if you haven't seen the show. The last episode is titled I Am You, and why they decided to call it this will soon become evident. It opens on Mick Mikhail, the eight-year-old son of Dari and Raquel, who back at the end of episode two mysteriously reappeared to his father. The catch? The real Mikhail died three years ago. Dari, a scientist, doesn't believe this is their son, even though he looks exactly like him and has all his memories. Raquel, wanting her son back, believes this is a second chance. But over the course of the season, we'll see that Mikhail has a dark side. He struggles with mental illness so bad that he cuts off the wings of a pet parrot, sets fire to a school hoping that his schoolmates will burn inside, and eventually cuts the throat of a woman trying to help him with a box cutter. In one of the most heartbreaking scenes of the series, Raquel abandons her son in the middle of nowhere. She is overwhelmed. Is this really her son, and if so, what do you do with a child who is filled with violent thoughts and acts them out without a shred of remorse? He ends up making his way back to his parents where they decide to do the unthinkable, but we'll get to that in a bit. In episode 7, and Dari investigates the glacier near the volcano, the place where these clones seem to originate. Way back in episode 1, he picked up mysterious readings from the samples given to him, and now he wants to investigate personally. He's also been inundated with local folktales of reappearing townspeople called changelings, and these date back to the 1300s. The reappearances coincide with the eruptions of the Katla volcano, and there's a reason for this. As Dari continues his investigation, he realizes that the reason his samples are picking up unexplainable readings is that they contain material not of this world. He theorizes that hundreds of thousands of years ago, a meteor hit the volcano and when it erupts, small pieces of it are brought to the surface and fall on the glacier. Dari says to his wife, he goes on to say, According to Dari, these clones are manifestations of their trauma. This Mikael isn't their son, he's a copy sent to help them deal with their trauma of losing their child. At the beginning of the season, Dari and Raquel are going through a divorce, likely a result of the loss of their child. Neither of them have gotten over this loss, and it eats away at their relationship. It's only when Mikael comes back do they realize their son is gone for good. <laughs> And in one of the most insane things I've seen on TV in a while, Dari and Raquel drown their son, or should I say the copy of it. Metaphorically, they are drowning their trauma. They are getting over the death of their child by killing their child. The whole thing is wild. And when they do the deed, for the first time, Dari and Raquel embrace. It's simultaneously tragic yet hopeful. With the revelation that the reappearing people are manifestations of trauma, it puts the other characters' experiences into perspective. 
perspective. Episode 1 begins with the reappearance of Gunhilda. The odd thing about her is that she believes it's the year 2001. Even weirder is that the real Gunhilda, 20 years older, is still alive in Sweden. They are copies, but one is 20 years younger. And there is a reason for this. 20 years ago, Gunhilda was impregnated by a man named Thor. She wanted to get rid of it, but due to a botched procedure, ended up injuring her child who grew up deformed. Or at least that's what she's thought for the last 20 years. She's been living with this guilt or trauma that she's harmed her child. She then overcompensates by being overly protected of him. By the way, the actor who plays the son, Bjorn, is one of the Skarsgård brothers. Gunhilda's manifestation comes back as a 20-year-old younger version of herself to prove that it wasn't her botched surgery that injured the child. It was genetic. She can finally let go of all that pain that's been bogging her down all these years. We also have Gisli, the town's police officer. His wife reappears, but unlike his actual wife, who is hooked up to a respirator, dying of lung cancer, this one is perfectly normal. He believes it's a sign from God and ends up switching his real wife's cancer pills with placebos to make her die faster so that he can be with this new version. But I like to think this manifestation isn't here for Gisli. She's here for his wife Magna to help her accept her own death. Whereas before, Magna lived in pain with a husband who almost assaults her, hooked up to a respirator, unable to move, and living with cancer. With the arrival of her clone, she accepts death. The Magna clone ends up taking the real one to die, head first into the volcano, and we can see this is what the real one wants. It's death on her own terms. Finally, we have Grima. She has so much trauma that she has two copies help, one of her dead sister Alsa and two of herself. And these are done for very different reasons. At the beginning of the series, Grima is in a bad place. She hasn't gotten over the death of her sister over a year ago, refuses to leave the desolate island, and is in a loveless marriage. Her husband, Kjartan, still cares for her, but Grima has walled herself off. At the end of episode one, Grima's sister mysteriously reappears. Alsa was Grima's older sister who struggled with alcoholism, likely the result of watching her own mother kill herself by drowning. She went missing a year ago when Katla erupted. Ausa also caught her father, Thor, cheating on her mother with Gunhilda. It's good writing how all these things weave together to create believable motivations for our characters. So Grima has a lot of trauma. She hasn't gotten over the death of her sister or even her mother for that matter. <laughs> This has put a strain on her relationships, mostly her marriage. So when Alsa reappears, it gives her a chance to say goodbye and vent those feelings and emotions she was never able to express. It gives her something she was never able to have, closure. This is encapsulated when she gives Alsa's clone the actual DNA results taken from her dead body that was uncovered in episode 4, an exact match. A woman who refused to believe her sister was dead by clinging to the hope she could still be out there now watches as the clone drowns herself in the water, the same way their mother did. It's eerily poetic. The Alsa clone has served her purpose and thus throws herself in the sea, but there's still one clone that lingers, an exact copy of Grima. At the end of episode 5, Grima finds a copy of herself. This copy is everything she isn't, or should I say, everything Grima used to be. Caring, affectionate, hopeful, a good partner. Grima even wonders if she's the changeling. The clone is who she used to be, and she's the one who's actually changed. And that's exactly why this Grima has a appeared, to hold a mirror to her, to show her what has happened to her and her relationships. You'll notice a lot of mirror symbolism incorporated here. This Grima clone lives a great loving life because she has forgiven her mother for killing herself, gotten over the death of her sister, and doesn't take her husband's love for granted. Perhaps Grima can have a life like this too if she can get over her trauma. The two Grimas decide to play Russian roulette to see who will stay, and the scene is shot in such a way that when one of them actually dies, we aren't sure who it is. Take a look at this shot. The Grima clone is on the left with the blue top, while the original is on the right. However, the camera will sometimes cut to a reflection in a mirror where the positions are reversed. This makes keeping track of who is who very tricky. So I went and counted the order and noticed something very sneaky. Here it is, and remember that this gun only has six chambers. Real Grima, fake, real, fake, then real, but just before the fifth shot goes off, it cuts to a picture of fake Grima. I'll let it play out here and watch as the beige top turns into the blue top after the second cut. 
it throws the entire back and forth off. We can't count anything that's happening here as the truth, considering the manipulation both in editing and via reflections. I think the creators want this ambiguity of us guessing who really survived. Regardless, the final six shot looks as though it's the Grima with the blue top, aka the clone, but I want to hear what you guys think in the comments below. In the next scene, we see the surviving Grima, happy with her family, as the dead Grima is buried in the ash outside. I'd like to believe that this is the real Grima who's gotten over her trauma and become what the fake Grima wanted her to be, but I guess we'll never know. We also see Bjorn here with Thor, his father. I'd like to think that they can forge a father-son relationship. Gizli, after failing to capture his wife, or should I say wives, asks for forgiveness from God. The funny thing here is that earlier in the season, one of the characters remarks that this painting of Jesus looks a lot like Thor, who is a god in Norse mythology. The final shots are of deep within the glacier, of more copies stirred by another blast of the volcano. Either this is the show's way of hinting at a season two, or perhaps it's a nod that trauma is a constant. Trauma happens, but we're the ones who have to decide whether to face it and move on or let it fester. Overall, Iceland's first original is as striking as Iceland itself. It's a portrait, much like the land it's filmed on, eerily beautiful. I'm hoping more people will get to check this show out. It may not be everyone's cup of tea, but its ending certainly will have people talking. Speaking of which, let me know what you thought about Kala below. I'm interested in your thoughts and theories. Thanks for watching everyone, please be sure to like and subscribe, every little bit helps the channel out, and for more bad takes you can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time remember, Daddy loves you very much.